Speaker, thank you. There was a man named David who sung that song in Psalm 51. Created me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. Restore the joy of my salvation so that I can answer your calling. Don't forget David, not our David, but David truly understood what it meant to be a man after God's own heart. So thank you, Justin. Thank you, team. And the singing, the songs, the praise, the worship, everything so far. So you're prepared to hear what God has for us to hear from his word. It's been good so far. Nelson, thank you for tonight. It was precious and beautiful. And the Lord, thank you all for coming to our coffee house setting. And there's time to share and gather. And uh, look forward to you tomorrow evening. David, make sure you drink lots of coffee and so that you're ready to go. But we are thrilled that we have another night to worship. Jose, thank you again for last evening. God used you in a tremendously powerful, strong way. Thank you for that message last night. Brother Steve, you're back. We need you again. Come to the pulpit and preach to us. Thank you, Steve. Good evening. It's good to see you guys. And I say amen. That was a great time of worship. It was a great time. These guys that came with me are all musicians. I'm not a musician. My problem is I speak in unknown tones. I, I sing in unknown tones. I said I speak. I sing in unknown tones. And, and the problem is usually the people don't have the gift of interpretation, so they don't want to hear me. They don't want to hear me sing. It's a disaster. But um, David and Jose both play the drums, and Nelson plays uh, the piano, keyboard. Do you play any other instruments? Julio does, right? Julio plays the guitar and the keyboard. The other guy I work with. Everybody's a musician except me. And so uh, I, really, I really enjoyed that. That was a great time of worship. And it's great to be with you guys tonight. I realized that yesterday um, I didn't talk much about, you know, what we're doing as a ministry and everything. And I did report on some of the statistics and everything. But what I wanted to remind you just before we get into the message is that uh, um, we live in El Salvador. And I think I have a map up here. Probably should turn it on first. Yeah, there it's on. They showed me how to use the pointer tonight so things could get dangerous. And so um, we live in Central America, as we've been saying before. And when we moved to El Salvador 36 years ago, uh, our goal was to start as many churches and reach as many people as we could in the country of El Salvador. But God put it on our heart about 20 years ago when Nelson was part of our uh, pastoral team, Nelson, Julio, and I, um, back in San Salvador, El Salvador, and put it on our heart to try to reach the rest of the world from El Salvador. And you were talking about how tiny Guatemala is with 19 million. We have 6.5 million, so we're even tinier. And, um, and we just felt like God wanted to use us to reach the rest of the world. El Salvador is a weird country. It's the same size as Israel, identical. You just take Israel and go like that, and that's El Salvador. And it rains six months in Israel and doesn't rain for six months. The same as El Salvador, identical, except it's backwards. Right now, we're finishing up the rainy season, and in Israel, they're starting the rainy season. There's a lot of parallels. And we just believe, even though it's a little tiny country, we can reach the world uh, from El Salvador. So God gave us a vision called Metro America 020. And just to make a long story short, at that time, I was preaching through the book of Acts, and we wanted to follow principles from the book of Acts. And we saw three principles that just stood out as from the book of Acts, that when they went to preach, they always went to receptive places. You remember what they would do when they weren't receptive? They'd shake the dust off their feet and they were out of there. In the cities, like Athens, was the key city. Did he stay there? They weren't receptive. And with people groups. And because Paul was Jewish, he kept trying and trying. Remember that? And eventually, when he went to Corinth, he said, I'm going on to the Gentiles. So that was our first principle. Second principle, Paul started in the cities. And we need to reach the countryside. Don't misunderstand me. But he started in the cities. When I went to the mission field, most missionaries didn't go to the cities. And a lot of them were very hard places. And um, we were neglecting at that time the cities in Latin America especially. And then um, we noticed another thing on missions was that they always used teams. Teams always went out. Teams. And in our church in San Salvador, in the capital of El Salvador, we have a t um, two uh, senior pastors. Although I always tell people that Julio is really the boss. But 
We, we work together as two. We're a team of two. And Nelson was part of our team before. And um, he had another team member with him when he was in Guatemala named Javier, and they sent him to Mexico City. And Jose had another person with him who has now come back to El Salvador. We're praying to send someone else on his team. And David has someone on his team, the same guy that led Jose to the Lord um, named Alex. And so we believe in teamwork. You know, it's an interesting thing. Everything that's always addressed in the New Testament is to the bishops or to the elders or to the deacons, except there was only one time there was one guy. One case I can find of only one, 3 John, and he was a rat. Remember 3 John? He doesn't receive us. And so teamwork was our big deal. So we said we're going to try to reach the world from there, and so we called our vision Metro, Metropolitan Areas, America, because although there's tremendous need in, um, in other parts of the world, we wanted to start in our backyard. We're at 13, 14 degrees um, parallel, so we decided to reach out between the Tropic of Cancer, which is 22.5, and the equator. But it doesn't sound good to say Metro America 022.5. So we made it a Metro America 020. And so we're between zero degrees and 20 degrees. This area right here in the Western Hemisphere has 300 million people. Um, conservative statistics say that over 220 million don't know the Lord. This includes the area that's uh, um, Ecuador, obviously means ec equator. So it's here. It's all these countries right above Guadalajara here. And it includes all this here. And we have all these big cities. You know, you just heard Nelson say that Guatemala City has 9 million people. Bogota has 10 million people. San Pedro Sula has over a million. A lot of you probably never even heard of San Pedro Sula, but it has over a million. Uh, Maracaibo, Maracay, Barquisimeto, all these places we've never heard of. they got millions of people. And most of them don't know the Lord, but they're receptive. They're receptive to the gospel. And so it's a great place to reach. And so we, we moved to this little tiny country called El Salvador, the size of Massachusetts, we help start churches throughout the country um, in Usulutan, in San Miguel, in San Francisco Gotera, in La Union, um, throughout the whole country, in the northern part of the country, all over the place. And then God gave us that vision to reach the rest of the world. And the first place we went was to Managua, Nicaragua. And we have a team of two missionaries there right now. Um, you can see El Salvador to the left there and Honduras. And then after that, I'm going to go a little bit faster here now. Then we sent Nelson to Guatemala City, Guatemala. He left our team, and he went to Guatemala City. And um, I'll tell you, we've never been the same. You know, somebody asked me one time, we were talking about missions, and they said, why do you guys always send your best workers to the mission field? I'm being honest with you. This is an expert on missions, and I'm not going to say what group he was with in the United States, but it used to be the biggest mission-sending organization. And we were telling him about sending um, David at the time to Colombia. And we said, we're praying about David maybe taking Julio's jobs, you know, place someday uh, in, down the road. And they said, why are you sending him then? I thought back for a second. I guess you send the best of what you love. I mean, we just love missions. We're going to send the best, you know. And we always tell the guys when we send them out, we're sending you because Julio and I are not the best. You're the best to send out. And this guy that told me was a pastor of a big church. And I said, you know, you're one of the greatest guys in this country. Why don't you go to the mission field? Well, the Lord's not calling me. You know, okay, that's cool. But we, we try to send the best. And so that's why we've stayed behind and we've sent these three guys. And there's, there's Guatemala City, 9 million people. And then we sent a missionary team to San Jose, Costa Rica. And then we sent a missionary team, of course, David and Alex, to Bogota, Colombia, 10 million people. This country has 40 million people. All these cities are huge. Medellin's huge. Cali's huge. And um, how many cities in Colombia have over a million people? five or six, All right, so it's just a huge, just a lot of people, and you can see the cities, Bar Barranquilla, Santa Marta, Cartagena, we got so much to do, there's just so much to do, we got to keep going, and then um, San Pedro Sula, and this is when we sent Jose and uh, Chiti, you can see where San Pedro Sula is right here, uh, close to El Salvador and Guatemala, and then this year, we sent a team to the largest city in the whole western hemisphere, it used to be the largest city in the whole world, Mexico City. Mexico City has 21 million people. It's just ridiculous. You can't get a picture of everything. You can't, you can't even conceive of the size of this place. It's just unbelievable. It's just people everywhere. People everywhere. And um, we went in March in the midst of the pandemic, and um, people are wide open to the gospel. And of course, it's different because you got to share the gospel through a mask, but they're on the streets, and we were seeing people get saved, so we just started that church. 
And so that's what our vision is. We want to reach the world, and I mentioned this yesterday, and it got me kind of excited, was that a missions director in a conference I went to said there are now more missionaries that go out of Central America than North America. And I was excited about that because I think that's our job. You know, we, we've, we've seen all these people saved and we need to send them out. You know, our country was 10% evangelical. When I moved there, we're over 40% evangelical. Uh, Guatemala City is almost 50% evangelical. Honduras is around 30 or 40% evangelical. Colombia is less, of course, 10%. And Mexico runs around that too. So there's tremendous need, and you guys are a part of it. You guys have helped us start these works. I know you pray for these works. And I pray that during this week you'll pray whether God wants you to go to the mission field because there's a need. There's a huge need. And, um, you know, I don't have to remind you this. Leo, that was the director of our ministry, always said this, that Jesus never paid, prayed for the harvest. You know, I think it's good to pray for revival. We do that all the time and things like that. But what did Jesus pray for? The workers. That's what we need. They're, they're out there. We need the workers badly. And so, interesting thing is people will ask me, well, why is your part of the country so receptive to the gospel? And I said, because we were always going from disaster to disaster. COVID's been horrible, but it's been very typical of, since I moved there 36 years ago. We've been through three earthquakes over 7.0, over 7 and big earthquakes are nasty. I'd rather go through anything but an earthquake, because everything comes tumbling down. And we've been through two major hurricanes. We've had huge flooding. We've had all kinds of diseases, um, chikungunya, um, Zika, and uh, dengue. Dengue fever is a nasty one, too. And, of course, now going through COVID just like you are. Unfortunately, our part of the country, a higher percentage of people die because I, don't, I think you know this. If you have diabetes, it's a lot tougher to get COVID. It's nasty. And we have a very high instance of, of diabetes in our part of the world. And so we go from disaster to disaster. And so when you lead people to the Lord and you're counseling new people, they always ask the same question. One of the most common questions I hear, why? Why? And when I became a Christian, you know what always bugged me about the Bible? God doesn't answer why. It really bugged me. He, he doesn't answer why. And, and, you know, let me just give you an example. Jesus is walking with the disciples. They see a blind man. And so they're just like we are. You know, why was this guy born blind? Remember that story? Why? why? Why was he born blind? It says, and Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. You know, people ask questions. Why are babies born with AIDS? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? Which that question always cracks me up because I'm still looking for those good people. That always cracks me up, you know. You know, the people that are always say, I think they're the good people. And the Bible says there is none that is good, right? Do we agree with that? But it's a belief, you know. Why do bad things happen to good people? And I understand what they're saying. People that aren't quite as bad as a murderer, you know, which is, is a lot of people. And so Jesus walks by and sees a man born that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Many of you think that the health and wealth teaching, which is the most popular in Latin America, by the way, most evangelicals are health and wealth um, in, in that movement in, El, in um, Central America, especially in San Pedro Sula. That is not a new teaching. That was taught by the Pharisees. The Pharisees said that if you were, had faith, you had money, and you never got sick. And of course, Paul was a loser for them. Paul was, he was an outcast because Paul got sick, and you know, Paul lived a pretty tough life. And so the teaching that if you're a believer and you have faith, you'll never get sick and have money, it was what the Pharisees taught. And so the disciples who had been influenced by those religious leaders, they see a blind man and automatically what comes to their mind? Who sinned? And he asked, did he sin? Well, that's ridiculous. When would he have sinned? In the womb or something like that? And of course, when you don't align yourself with the Bible, you come up with these crazy questions. Or his parents, that he was born blind. And you know what? Jesus didn't answer the question. You know why? Because it's a why question. Why is he blind? Why is there coronavirus? Why was I born in the family I was born in? Why did my mom die when I was little? Why do babies be born with AIDS? There's a book that's 42 chapters where basically that's the question. And do you guys remember how it ends, Job? He doesn't answer the question. He doesn't answer why. It, this is what Jesus does answer, though. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And so it sounds better in Spanish, but I'm going to say the way it comes out in English. God never answers the question, why, which is por qué in Spanish. He only answers the question, what for. 
para qué. Think about that for a second. I don't know why you grew up where you did. I don't know why you may be sick with the sickness you have, but I know what for. I can't tell you why. I can tell you what for. And it's to glorify God. It's to make manifest his works. And this is why I believe God does that. If you live with a why, you live in the past. If you live for the what for, where do you live? In the future. And, and even if you knew why, does it help you? Let's say you break your leg tonight. You go to the doctor to emergency and you say to the doctor, why did I break my leg? Why did I break my leg? And the doctor says, well, you have to understand the conservation of the law of momentum. When you were walking across the street, that car was coming with a certain amount of momentum. And you know that it has to be conserved when that car hit your leg. And so it produced a force that was greater than what the stress on your leg could take. And that's why it broke. Oh, great, I feel good now. <laughs> I know why. That's wonderful. I know why. But if he says, here's how you can get cured from it, you get hope. What for is hope? Why is living in the past? I don't know why you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with. It's not. I really don't, but I know what for. It's to do incredible things for God. And I've learned in life that the people that God uses the greatest are people that said, why was I born with this problem? Why did I come from this family? I don't know, but I know what for. I'm going to glorify God with this. And many times when we read the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, many of you already know this passage. I don't even have to read it, even though I will. But Isaiah 6, where he does the famous thing where he says, woe is unto me, right? Here I am, send me. A lot of people don't understand the context of Isaiah 6. You, 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 because you have to ask yourself the question, why does Isaiah wait six chapters to go into the temple? Right? Where was he the first five chapters? And I believe the reason Isaiah went into the temple, I'm going to tell you why I think. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up in his train and filled the temple. King Uzziah had been king for over 50 years. And according to historians, it was the most prosperous time in the history of Judah. And the people loved him. And Uzziah was a good king until he went into the temple and, and, and gave incense. Remember that? And he was struck with leprosy. But if you can imagine your favorite president of all time, think about the one that's your favorite, and that's your president for 54 years, and you have the greatest prosperity, and they die. It's a crisis. It's a disaster. And if you want to touch people, coronavirus doesn't work. What works is economic crisis. That's what touches people. And this is an economic disaster. And so it causes Isaiah to go in to the presence of the Lord. And I thought about this during COVID. One of the hardest things during COVID, and I love that special song that you did, Justin, is connecting with God. It's hearing from God. It's going through the time. As I get older, the thing that I love more than anything else is to be alone, silent, and hear from God. I, I just treasure that, to hear from him. And, and so in COVID, it's hard when there's a crisis to connect with God. And so I want to title the message tonight is How to Connect with God in the Midst of the Crisis. I believe that for us to answer our holy calling, we have to connect with God. You have to hear it from him. You know, they're, they're, people will ask you, what's the number one reason that missionaries leave the mission field? And, and I don't know. I've heard all these statistics and everything. And, and uh, many people, someone told me, that, and, and Bobby knows more about this than me, but I think the average was four or five years for a lot of missionaries. And a lot, of course, is because of health issues or, or something bad happens in the family. But I'm referring to people that don't absolutely have to come back where they have no choice. And, and they say the number one reason is, one of the reasons they say is problems with the other missionaries. And they give all these reasons and everything. But what I tell all the missionaries when they're going to go out to the place, there's going to be dark moments, dark moments, where the only thing you're going to have is the call of God. You know, when I moved to El Salvador, we were in the middle of a civil war. You remember the Sandinistas? Remember all that time and everything? We lived in the country where they were trying to make it go communist. And the guerrillas were in the, in, the, in the outer areas, and it was terrorism, and we watched so many people die. And during that time, there was moments where the only reason I stayed in El Salvador was because God had called me. And that connection with him was so important. And so what I want to talk about tonight, and I think it has to do with missions because we're talking about the holy calling, is how do we stay connected to God as, as we go through a crisis? How do you stay connected to God through coronavirus or whatever you're facing? Because when you start talking to different people, they'll tell you they're going through things that are way worse than that. And so how do we stay connected with God? I think you can see clearly three principles here. Isaiah 6, verse 1. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, which means two, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. One preacher one time said, An easy way to summarize this message is, Woe, lo, and go. And I mean, I, I agree with that. And a lot of you say, That would be a good message. Let's go home. You know, that, 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 let's, look at, let's look at three principles here that have to do with connecting God. First principle, I think, is, contemplating the majesty of God, contemplating his majesty. David was a person that went from crisis to crisis. I think everybody agrees with that. He was always in crisis. And the one thing that David always looked for above all things was to contemplate, I love that word, his majesty. It says in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. When I'm going through a crisis in my life and I've spent time with the Lord and I know he's there with me, I can go through any crisis. When we know that the Lord is there, we can do it. And that's why we have to lift up your eyes, as you were singing about. We have to lift up our eyes and see the Lord. We need to be connected to him at every moment. Now, notice there's, there, there's three little things here about contemplating. Three things. Number one, you contemplate the position of his majesty. Look, look at what it says one more time. It says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, and, and I'm one of those guys, I love every word of the Bible. I don't think any word's wasted. I think every single word has a reason. He says, I saw the Lord upon the throne high and lifted up. The position, he was above. You know, it's interesting if you live in mountains. I know that you guys, your biggest mountain is Lee's Summit, right? Is that, is that your... And I'll be honest with you, I had to go to Lee's Summit today to do some shopping, shopping for my wife. And I never saw it. I never saw a mountain. Where is that summit? Someone needs to tell me where it is. But I'm in search this whole week. Where are you, Steve? I'm in search of Lee's Summit. Where is that place? I mean, I know the town. But you guys don't have a lot of mountains, but you guys know what mountains are. And here's an interesting thing about the Bible. How many times does God meet with someone on a mountain when something's real important? Does everybody agree with me on that? Why a mountain? What's the big deal about a mountain? Well, we live in a place with lots of mountains. In our part of the world, because it's so hot, they always settled up in the mountains. And, and, um, and Nelson's a mile high. You know, they talk about the mile high city here, but Guatemala City's a mile high, the very top part of it. But um, you know that David lives at 9,000 9, feet? 9,000 feet above sea level. Yep, 9,000 feet. And um, uh, Jose lives about minus 10 feet above sea level. And his place is hot. I mean, it is really hot. But we live in a place of mountains, and an interesting thing about mountains, it took me a long time to figure this out. Why does, why does Moses have to go up to a mountain? People say, well, it's secluded. Well, the desert's secluded too. This is why I think he has people go to a mountain. If you go up to the mountain, something always happens. Your perspective changes. We have a huge volcano, because we have 23 volcanoes in that little tiny country of El Salvador. We have a huge volcano called Boqueron, the big mouth. It's a big crater. And if, if you're down in the city, you feel like a rat in a maze. All these big buildings, all these buses, all these people. We have the most densely populated country in, Western, in the Western Hemisphere. There's people everywhere you go. And, and so you're down there like a little rat, but you go up to the mountain. And you look down there at this, at this downtown city, and it's tiny. Those, mount, those big buildings that were so intimidating, they're like little ants. And so when you go to the Lord, think about this. Where is he sitting? He sits above the circle of the earth, and he sees the people as grasshoppers. And so when you connect with the Lord, you go up. And where are your problems? Down. I think many of us are overwhelmed by our problems because we don't connect with the Lord. 
We don't see him. You know, and it says in John 12, I love this if you read John 12, 40 later on, it says that Isaiah saw Jesus. And because you know that in the Old Testament, he wasn't called Jesus yet. But every time somebody saw the Lord, it was the pre-incarnate Christ. And so I thought about that application to me. When I'm going through a disaster in my life, there's one thing I need above all things is to get away and I've got to see him. I've got to see him in his word. And I've got to see that he is above everything that's coming against me. There is nothing coming against you tonight that's not below his feet. And we need to remember how high and up he is lifted up. And so here comes, and look at what he saw. What did he see? He saw the train. Well, now, what does that mean? It's the bottom part of his robe. Where was Isaiah? He's on his face. He's on his face in the temple. Now, I personally believe that Isaiah was a Levite. It never says what family he comes for a tribe. But I don't see how he could go into the temple and get away with it if he was not from the tribe uh, of the Levites. And so he's a prophet, and he's probably a priest, and he comes in. So that's the first thing you got to do. you you got to see his, his position. Second thing, second thing, the perfection of his majesty. And we're going to see why this is important in a few minutes. It says, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and two covered the face, two covered his feet, and two he, he flied. And, and, and they were saying what everybody says in God's presence. You ever, you ever thought about this? It, it's, it's almost repetitive. Every time someone's in God's presence, what are they always saying? Love, love, love. Goodness, goodness, goodness. They're always blown away by one thing. Holy, holy, holy. I love prophecy. Prophecy is my favorite thing because I grew up in an atheist home. And and, and people say you can't prove God exists. Someone should have told God that. Because in Isaiah, he says, I am God because I can tell you what's going to happen before it happens. That's in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 46. That's the proof that God exists. It's a definite proof. Because he tells what's going to happen, it always happens. And so coming from an atheist home, I love prophecy. Because everything he says is going to happen is going to happen. And I've preached through the book of Revelation a lot of times. And the first time I preached through it, I always had a problem. Why is everybody happy in heaven with the judgments? It really bugged me. I mean, if you ever noticed that, they're praising the Lord for the judgments. And I thought, Why? It's because they're next to holiness. They can't stand the sight of of contamination. They can't stand the sight of sin. And this is so important for Isaiah. He has to see the perfection of the Lord. He has to see his holiness so he can see how far he's fallen and get right with the Lord. And so he, here's the, now who are the seraphim? I don't know. I know they're not the cherubim because the cherubim don't move, right? Aren't the cherubim, there's four of them around the throne of God? right? And it doesn't say they move. They move with the throne in Ezekiel. Remember Ezekiel 1? They move with the throne. But these seraphim can fly. And this is scary. One of the things I always try to do when I study the Bible is put myself in the shoes of the person there. And so I come before the Lord because I'm in crisis. I'm just, this is horrible. Uzziah's died. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go seek the Lord. I walk in. I see him high and lifted up, which is great. And then there's these creatures that are flying around. They're covering their eyes because they can't look on God's holiness. They're covering their feet to show that they're prepared to serve the Lord. And they're quickly flying around. And they're all saying the same thing. Holy, holy, holy. Because God is holy. And one more thing that you can see here. His power. His power. And there's a picture of a seraphim. I don't know if that helps you. Did that help you guys? I don't know. This is an idea of what a seraphim looks like. But um, they're not angels. Because angels don't have wings. And they're not cherubim. But they're a special creature. Seraphim literally means, in Hebrew, the burning ones. And so they're consumed, and they're they're before God there. And and the last thing is the power of his majesty. We need to know that he's high enough, lifted up, that he's a holy God, and he's all-powerful. Look look at at what it says here. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me. For I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. He was before the holiness of God in that moment. And and it's interesting, we always say where there's smoke, there's fire. And that's what's happening here at this moment. It it says in Revelation 15, 8, talking about the same temple. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. The smoke came from his power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And so what you're seeing is a vision of an all-powerful God lifted high up and holy. I propose that we need that every single day. 
We need to start every single day realizing we're going to work and it's going to be a tough day, but there's someone who's lifted above, there's someone more powerful, and there's someone that's more holy. He, he's a special God. And, and so the first takeaway I get from this is in the midst of the crisis, take time to contemplate the majesty of God. You realize that he's much bigger and powerful than any crisis. Than any crisis. First principle. Second principle. Second principles. Confess your misdeeds. That's what he does right here when he says, woe is me. How many people remember when the Chilean miners were trapped? Chilean miners. Remember how many there were? 33. Somebody wrote a book. His name is Hector, or Hector in Spanish, Tobar. And, and this guy wrote this book, and there, there's a copy in English. And it's really interesting because he says that when they were plummeted and covered up in total darkness, that they kind of found each other in one area. And they asked a guy named Jose Enriquez to start praying for him. Apparently, Jose Enriquez is the only one that they believed was a believer. I guess they were rough guys, you know, rough people that were working down there. And they asked Jose, would he start praying for them? So what they would do is they would come together once a day, bring the little bit of food they had, and they would talk to each other. And an incredible thing started to happen. Every time they would meet, they would confess their sins to God and to each other. Hey, man, I'm sorry about the way I treated you. I'm sorry about what was going on. Because Jose Enriquez, that was his example. The first time he prayed, he asked forgiveness from God. And so during that whole time, they had this mini revival down there. Many of you remember the image of the first guy who came up. What did he do? He's thanking God. They're talk, all they're doing is talking about God during that whole time. And it's because of what happened when they're in that darkness. But when the best thing that could have happened happened, it was actually the worst thing that could have happened. As soon as they opened up, and we're able to send down the supplies, guess what stopped? The prayer meeting. I, I hate crisis, but I have to tell you so many times when I have a crisis, it causes me to go before the Lord. And when we go before the Lord, we start seeing what's going on in our life in, in every moment. You remember that part when they started bringing everything up at that time. I, I like what somebody said about that. They said, we were made in God's image, right? We all agree with this. And seeing God, what was the first part of our message? Contemplate his majesty. Seeing God is seeing ourselves. Well, seeing how far we've fallen away, right? It's like going to a mirror. I see God in the word of God, and I see, man, I'm, I've gone a long way from there. When we see ourselves in the light of God's glory, we see, like Isaiah, how far we have fallen. And we need that. We need in that moment. This is what changes Isaiah's life. He sees the Lord risen up. And then he realizes that he's gone through this crisis so he can connect with God at this very moment. Now, notice a few th interesting things here. It says in verse 5, Then said I, woe is me. Now, this is interesting. And here I'm going to tell you what I think. You may not be in agreement. But I think in the first five chapters of Isaiah, he was not right with the Lord. This is what I think. And the reason I think that is what he says here in verse 5. He says, he says, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, I don't know if he used bad words. We do know that what comes out of your mouth comes from where? Your, your heart. And I don't know if he swore, you know, if he used bad words. I don't know what his problem was, but this is something that really hits me. This is really interesting. In chapter 5, there are six woes. Let me, let me show you this. This is really interesting. I mean, I think it's interesting. If you don't, nod your head anyway, okay? And so it says in chapter 5, verse 8, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, and they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Verse 10, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Uh, verse, got to go all the way down to verse 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cor cart rope. And then verse 20, everybody knows. I think everybody's heard this before. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And number six, woe. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Six woes. So what is Isaiah 6? The seventh woe. And this is what I think was Isaiah's problem. I think he was typical of many Christians. When you're just not quite right with the Lord, what do you do all the time? Whoa, 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 whoa. Then you get before the Lord and you go, whoa, 
right? You get before the Lord, and who's the only woe? Me. I can tell you something about critical people that I'm sure of. One thing I know about critical people, I'm sure of this 100%, they don't spend time with the Lord. See, see, if you're in the presence of a holy God, you realize what the problem is. It's sitting and looking at you right in the face, in the mirror. And here's Isaiah, who's a great prophet. Isaiah 2 is an incredible prophecy. Everything he says in the first five chapters, but he's not right with the Lord according to what he says. And he was like, he's just kind of like a typical mediocre Christian, you know? Just, just kind of doing some good stuff. Knows enough about the Bible to criticize others and condemn others and post on Facebook. I heard Facebook shut down. Is that true? Okay, we'll, we'll pray at the end of the, of the you know, message and everything. What's the problem for me is what's up. Probably you've never heard of what's up, but that's what you use if you live overseas to, to contact other people. But a person that sees God doesn't say, whoa, whoa, whoa. They say, whoa. You know, I like it better in Spanish because it's I. And I always say, he said, I, I, I. And then he said, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> you know, when he looked before the Lord. Sounds better in Spanish. Anyway. And so Isaiah says, ay, 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 ay. He's looking at the Lord. And, and that's what happened. Now, remember, we're putting ourselves in the, in the shoes of, of Isaiah. So, so look what happens next here. It says, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. I don't know about you, but if I would have seen one of these seraphim guys flying towards me with a hot coal, you know what I would have thought? He's taking me straight to hell. That's what I would have thought. I would have been terrified. But here's the best take of this whole thing tonight. I'm thankful that God has a throne in heaven that speaks of his holiness. But almost nobody talks about the most important thing in heaven. You see, if God only had a throne, he'd only be holiness. We'd all go to hell. But what else does he have in heaven? Do you see it? What is it? An altar. And that's why it's called the throne of grace. The altar's all about grace. You see, he did not take that coal from hell. He didn't take it from the throne. He took it from the altar. Because God is saying, I'm going to heal you. Because you come before me and you've done the only thing you need to do to get right with me. You've confessed that you're messed up. And he comes before him and he says, I'm undone. I'm unclean. And so he sends the seraphim with a coal. Now, why was it a coal? Because he couldn't send Jesus. Jesus hadn't died on the cross for his sins. What was the only way you could deal with sin in the Old Testament? The brazen altar. Does everybody agree with me on that? The brazen altar. And that's where you would have your sacrifices. And so what Isaiah is seeing is the grace of God reaching out. Even though he was a rotten dog, he reaches out to him and he heals his mouth. And it's the same with me. I need to go before the Lord so I can see what's wrong in my life. And then God doesn't bring a hot coal from the, the altar on the basis of what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross for my sins. And so he comes and he touches his mouth. And this is really cool. It says, lo, there's, I already said the woe. Here's the lo. And he said it, it, uh, laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I think I wrote up here what the difference is between iniquity and sin in the Old Testament. Iniquity refers to doing bad things. Sin refers to not doing good things. I think everybody knows that, right? Sin means literally missing the mark. Iniquity means you know something's bad and you do it. That's a kind of sin. Sin means you don't do what you should do, which is the right thing. And so here he comes with the coal, and he covers it all at once. And so he confesses his misdeeds at that point. And he's clean, and it says your sin is purged. And so it's a picture of Jesus. In the midst of the crisis, take time to get right with God so you can convert your crisis into an opportunity. Because here comes the best part. I don't know why King Uzziah died. I don't know why Isaiah had to go through this crisis. I don't know why you've lost your job. I don't know why you're fighting with a disease you might be fighting with. I don't know why you were born in the family you were born. I don't know why your mom died. I don't know why your dad died. I don't know why, but I know what for. And because that's what we're going to see right here. You see, he's gone through this whole thing so he can get to the most important part. He says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. The last thing is to comply with his mission. That's the only way to convert a crisis into a blessing. You just preach the gospel. 
I mean, every time you do it, you're taking that rotten, stinking thing in your life. Many of you have heard of Johnny, I just forgot her name, Todd Erickson. Erickson Todd, thank you. I appreciate that. And so she dives into a pool, and she breaks her neck, and she probably is asking why. And God's used her to lead all kinds of people to the Lord. She even has a ministry in El Salvador. And, and I've noticed that with so many people who go through horrible heartbreak in their life, and they say, I'm going to take this and use this to reach other people. They take meaning out of their life. But so many people, a high percentage, live in the past. They got to know why. They got to go talk to somebody. They got to find out why. Why do my parents do this to me? I got to find out who's guilty for this. Why is there coronavirus? Who did this? Why did they do this? Which political party is responsible? And they spend all their time living in the past instead of living in the future and saying, what can I use this for at this moment? It's inc- you remember last year I shared with you, and I don't remember any of you remember me sharing with you during COVID. Um, I guess I would have been seen there, right? And I shared this passage because it blows my mind. Greatest book ever written on happiness. I asked you last year, see if you remember. Philippians, there's no greater book. No greater book written on happiness. Do you know that that book was written from prison? From the crisis man. The crisis man's Paul. And look at what Paul says. He says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. They write a letter to Paul. I said, Paul, poor guy, man, you can't go out on your, your, your journeys. You're such a great guy. Why is this happening to you? And he says, look, I want you to know something here. Don't cry for me. It's a result in the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. I mean, he says, yes, I'm chained to these guards. And I don't know why, but I know what for. Because every 12 hours, I share the gospel with a new guy. And it says later on in Philippians that he won many of them to the Lord. Because he understood everything that happens to me happens so that I can keep the gospel going. And it gave him great joy in his life every time that, that he met other people. So if I get a flat tire, why did I get a flat tire? So that somebody could stop and help me and I can share the gospel. Why do I got to stand in line? You guys don't have that problem, but Latin America is lines, unbelievable lines. I call them apocalyptic lines. It's unbelievable. You just wait hours and hours and hours. And I don't know how many times I've stood in line and people like to cut in line and you're just losing your mind. And one day in my life, I says, I'm turning this around. I'm standing in this stupid line to share the gospel with the person next to me. You know, the line goes by faster that way. Did you know that? It's an incredible thing. Why did I get sick? To share the gospel with the doctor, with the nurses. Why did my aunt die? So we could preach the gospel at the funeral and on and on. I could bore you with that. But Isaiah knows that that was the reason it said. Jim Elliott's the famous man who was killed by the Auka Indians. Remember that story in Ecuador? He said this before he went, Lord, make me a crisis man. Let me not be a mile post on a single road, but make me a fork that men must turn one way or another in facing Christ in me. I want to be a crisis man. I want to go from crisis to crisis. I want to show people that our God's so big that all these little wimpy crises can't do anything. My God is a great God. He's bigger than that. Allow me to go through the crisis so I can see the world changed. And he had that attitude. Now, 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 just to finish this up, I want you to notice some interesting things here. Number one, the importance of his mission. Notice that it says, whom shall I send, this is the Lord, and who will go for us? What? You know, that's as weird as that verse that says, and God said, let us make man in our image. Isn't that weird? And of course, it isn't weird to us to know that God manifests himself in three people, right? In three persons, excuse me, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, the mission to share the gospel is so important that the Father sends his spirit to give you the power, and you proclaim Jesus. And all three of them are working on this. He's saying, look, Isaiah, we got an important mission here, the Trinity. Who are we going to send? And he says, send me. That, that's how important that mission is. And, of course, he says the famous words, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. We have a guy we work with that has been here before named Koki. His name's Jorge, but we call him Koki. And he always says, he always says this all the time. He says, here I am. Send someone else. He says, that's the theme of almost all Christians, you know. And so when there's a, a crisis or a problem and we're having a campaign, and go, don't worry, Brother Steve. He says, here I am. Send anybody else, you know. And so I think a lot of Christians think the same way. Send anyone else but me, please. Anybody else that you can send. So, so look at this, verse 9. And he said, go and tell this people, hear you indeed, but understand not. And see you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat... And make their heart ears heavy, 
and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. What? I've gone through all this trouble. I've come and seen the Lord high and lifted up. I've confessed my sin. I'm ready to go change the world. And God says, um, here's your mission, make people hard. What? That, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I got a question for you. It, I'm going to skip this because of time. Uh, what is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament? What is the most quoted, most commonly quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament? Does anybody know? This. This right here. It's quoted in all the Gospels and Acts and Romans. It's number one. Remember when Jesus spoke in parables? Remember that? And the, and the disciples said, why are you speaking in parables? And I'm going to skip this too. I'll explain it later. He says, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And then the prophecy of Isaiah, well, we'll read this fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. And so somebody says, well, why in the world does that happen? Well, why does it say in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 2, that we're a savor of death unto those that are lost and a savor of life unto those that are being saved? Well, why is that? Why is it when we preach the gospel, we harden people? Well, you have to understand how the law worked with the nation of Israel. If you were disobedient to God, look at what he did. It says, and it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now, now there's a whole list of curses, but look at this one in verse 28. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. And you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. You see, you've got to realize that the Bible's all about love. It's just a love book, right? God is love. What's the only way you can show love? There's only one way. One way, there's no other way. One way, only one in the whole Bible. If you love me, obey my commandments. So God makes Adam and Eve, and he wants to know, do, they, do you love me? Do you love me? Well, I've got to find out. I'm going to ask him to do something simple. You can't eat of that tree. And they show that they love the world more than they love God. So he raises up the nation of Israel. Do, do you love me? Uh, yeah, we love you very much. Okay, obey me. If you don't obey me, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to blind you. Okay? And so when, we, when Isaiah was amongst the people, it was very hardened. And they were hardened because they didn't love God. That's what hardened their heart. And he says, I want you to keep preaching and hardening their heart. You know why preaching the gospel hardens the heart of a hard person? If the Raiders win tonight, how many people here are going to be happy? No. If Derek Carr breaks his leg, some of you are going to be happy. You won't admit it, but some of you are going to, somebody said amen. But it's the same way with God. If God's not on your team and you hear great things about God, what happens to you? Why was, why was Pharaoh's heart hardened by God? Because he saw miracles. God didn't go mystically into his heart and make it harder. You harden the heart when a person doesn't want to obey you. They get madder. And the better things they see about you, the more madder they are. If it isn't your political candidate and they're doing good, you're even madder. And it's the same with your sports team. And so what he says to Isaiah is, because it's going to all make sense when we finish here. He's saying, Isaiah, here's your plan. These guys are hard. They're rotten. This is what I want you to do. You're going to preach the gospel, and you're going to harden them, and you're going to harden them. But here's the application for the United States. Verse 11. He said what I would have said. Then said I, Lord, how long? This is rotten. I don't want to do this anymore. How long do I got to do this? These people are hard. And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaken in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth. Remember, a tenth is always the Lord's. It's the remnant. And it shall return and shall be eaten as a teal tree or as an oak. Remember, those kind of plants, you can cut them all the way down, and what comes out of the trunk? Something can grow anyway. Whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Allow me, please, to paraphrase this. I stand before the Lord. I see him high and lifted up. I see his holiness. Oh, Lord, I'm unholy. I'm undone. He sends a seraphim to, as a picture of healing me. What healed me was that I confessed it, of course. And so he touches my lips. 
And then I say, Lord, here I am, send me. And he says, okay, here's your mission. Preach until they get hard. And how long? Okay. When the sun comes out, let's say you have crayon here, a crayon. And let's say you have some clay. Okay? Same sun, what happens to the crayon? What happens to the clay? Right. Whose fault is it? The sun? No. It's the fault of the crayon or the clay. When God does great things and your heart hardens, whose fault is it? You. It's your heart. Okay? Don't blame it on God. You're hardening your own heart. But what happens to clay if you keep hardening it? What happens eventually? It breaks. Ooh, it breaks. And so your dad's heart of the gospel. What should you do? Oh, he'll never get saved. No, you keep loving him. And you keep talking about Jesus. Don't make him mad on purpose. But you keep talking. You know what happens one day? It breaks. The reason he said to preach the gospel and harden them is because he didn't want them to go to hell. He wanted them to go to heaven. He wants to break them. We've got to understand the most important thing before God is we have to be broken. He can't use us unless we're broken. And many times when we don't listen and we're disobedient, our heart becomes harder and it becomes harder, not because he's given up on us, not because he's thrown us out. It's because he loves us and it hardens and it hardens. And the houses are desolate and there's nothing you can do and it breaks. I came from an atheist home. I was 17 years old when I heard the gospel for the first time. And I've told you before, I was always seeking God because I see God in creation. So somebody must have made all this. Someone shares the gospel, I get saved. I tell my dad about it. He said, don't ever mention the name of Jesus or religion or the Bible in this house again. And so I would always try to bring it up, and he'd get mad. And I would pray for him and pray for him. One day, I read this passage, and God showed me, you don't know how to pray for your dad you got to pray for one thing for your dad, only one thing, that he'll get broken. Your dad has to be broken. A proud man, military, German descent, proud man, he'll never get saved until he's broken. So I started praying for him to be broken. He got emphysema because he's a heavy smoker. Then he had to get a, um, what do you call that thing you put in your, your heart? A pacemaker. Then he had a quintuple bypass. Still didn't get him. He's a heavy drinker, got diabetes. Didn't quit drinking, so what happened to his kidneys? Dialysis. And most people would think, man, that must have been horrible. You're probably all the time praying that God would heal him. Nope. I want my dad healed. Don't misunderstand me. I want him healed, but I want him to be really healed. What good does it do if he's healed of all his physical ailments and goes to hell? I want him to be healed. And he was broken. One day, you know, when I was in El Salvador, I'd come home and I'd, I'd talk to my family, and everybody knew, don't ask Steve what he does. He's crazy. He's a lunatic. He's going to talk about preaching the gospel and all this. So my wife hated going to our house because we just sit there and just go, how about those giants? You know, they live in Northern California. You know, how about the 49ers and all this kind of stuff? And just talk about nothingness for, for a whole week. And then, then, I'm sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent. One time, my youngest sister gets married, and her husband one time comes in, and he goes, hey, Steve, what do you do, by the way? And I said, everybody go, oh, no, why do you ask him? <laughs> I'm glad you asked, Dan. And, and so, ah, you know, everybody gets out of there. So anyway, I go visit my dad uh, as he's on dialysis. And there's a Steve Green cassette on the table in my house. This would be like going to a satanic temple and finding a Steve Green cassette. Does anybody remember Steve Green? He was a, he was a Christian singer. Okay. And so I'm going, what is going on here? So I asked my stepmother, who I'd shared the gospel with, and uh, she said, well, you know what? My best friend got saved. And her husband, who's my dad's drinking buddy, got saved. God's answer in prayer. So my dad and I, we went, we went one place, and I said, you know, Dad, I've been talking about the Lord Jesus, and he want, I thought he was going to crush me, and he didn't. I shared, somebody said yesterday I talked fast, and I apologize for that, but I talked really fast that time. I just said, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we're all sinners. And Romans 6.23 says, that everybody, and it says, you want to get saved, Dad? Huh? What are you talking about, you know? And so my dad didn't get saved then. And so I kept sharing with him. He just got really messed up physically. So I'm December, I called him December 17th, 1999. I said, Dad, 
how are you doing? And I says, you know, you remember what I've been talking to you about? He says, keep praying. And tell Scott, the guy who led me to the Lord, tell him to keep praying for me, and Leo to keep praying for me. I got a report in January 30th of the next year, year 2000. I called him December 17th, 1999. It says, your dad's messed up. And so I went to the States. I went in to talk to him in the hospital. They had him on a ventilator. And I looked at him, and I could read his eyes. You know, with the mask, you're, you can read eyes now, you know. And I know what my dad said. I just could tell. My dad said, what the, you know, he always used bad words. Are you doing here? You know, looking up at me with his eyes and says, dad, you know how important it is to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And he goes like this. And he went unconscious. So make a long story short, he dies a few days later. I have to do the funeral. Who's going to show up at the funeral? My sister who converted, converted to Mormonism. So it was all Mormons with her. And my dad's drinking buddies from the Air Force. And most were atheists. So I said, what am I going to do? i got to preach to atheists and Mormons. And so I prepare the whole thing, this whole funeral thing, at a military cemetery, uh, military cemetery called Mount Vernon. I'm looking at all these people, and I told them the story I just told you. And I said, a lot of you are sitting here thinking, what in the world is going on here? A religious funeral for Ward Kern? That was my dad's name. And I said, let me tell you the story. I told what I just told you. I don't know if my dad got saved. But it's strange to me that he requested Amazing Grace with the Scottish bagpipes. And that's a big military deal. And I said, and I told the story of John Newton, the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. And I says, I believe God was reaching out to my dad in his grace. And, and, and I preached the gospel, went to the back, 21-gun salute. I'm standing there by the 21-gun salute, and this lady comes running up to me. She goes, hi, my name is Mary Helen. I was a social worker for your dad. I thought, oh no, a social worker from California. She's going to kill me. <laughs> All I need is for her to chew me out because he lived in Sacramento at this time. And so I said, oh, that's really interesting. She goes, I'm really concerned about what you said about your dad. She says, I saw your dad December 24th. Now, remember when I called him? December 17th. I saw your dad December 24th. And I said, Ward, have you trusted Jesus Christ yet? Who is this social worker from California is preaching the gospel to my dad? Well, God answers prayer. And so I said, she goes, I'm really concerned that you don't know that your dad got saved. He said to me, Mary Helen, I've been the hardest man on the planet, but I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I broke down. I don't cry. My dad taught me men don't cry. If I go to a movie with my wife that's real dramatic, if you look at me, I'm like this. I wish I could cry like you. I can't do it, man. I just, I'm, it's because real men don't cry. But I cried. I did. I lost it. And, and I said to her, go talk to my stepmom. Because my stepmom had just got saved. And we went to the reception in my house. And it's all atheists and Mormons. And my stepmom's running. I can't believe that Ward got saved. I can't. And all these people are looking. What is this? A bunch of fanatics? Don't give up. Please hear me here. I hear so many Americans tell me, oh, you're in a receptive place. Don't give up. Did Isaiah give up? No. Most quoted scripture in the New Testament. You can look it up yourself. Quoted from the Old Testament. Don't, don't give up. Keep praying, but pray for brokenness. It's much better that the person you love be ruthlessly broken so they can be saved. And that's why when there's a disaster in this country, it doesn't bother me. You're probably going to throw eggs at me when I leave. But this country, that's what it needs for revival. We need people broken. We need the clay hardened, and then it just breaks apart. We need to pray that God, we need to connect with God in the crisis. We need to go before him, and we need to see him high and lifted up and say, it isn't your fault. It isn't that political party. I'm the problem. And then we need to say, God, use me. Use me. God, save my aunt. Save my uncle. Save the people I work with. They're so hard to the gospel. And then he does great things in their life, and they get harder and harder. And one day, it all breaks. Because God hardens hearts so they can be saved, not the other way around. Because God wants everyone to be saved. That's what the Bible teaches anyway in 1 Timothy 2, 4, and 5. And so I believe God has given us a holy calling. But the only way we're going to change this world is by connecting with him. And to connect, we've got to contemplate his majesty, confess our misdeeds, and comply with his mission. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word that's so clear to us. 
And thank you for the example of Isaiah, who was able to connect with you and change the world. Thank you for the great prophecies that we read about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Isaiah saw, saw Jesus before he was born. And Lord, we want to see Jesus tonight. We want to see Jesus. We have through the music, hopefully through the message. And we want to see Jesus as we read the, the scripture so that we can remember that he's bigger than anything we have. I pray for everybody tonight that's facing a crisis in their life, facing a problem in their life, that you would remind them one more time that you're bigger, you're more powerful, and you're more holy than anything that's coming against us. All the things that the world brings against us are a joke compared to you, Lord. Help our faith to grow that we would believe that. And I pray, Lord, that if there's somebody here tonight that doesn't know you in a personal way, you would touch their heart too. In Jesus' name I pray. And with our heads still bowed and our eyes.